everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel today, Engendering Climate Equity and Justice, Women Leaders on Impact and Solutions. My name is Anais Reyes, and I'm from the Climate Museum. I'm the Senior Exhibitions Associate. Uh, Miranda was unfortunately not feeling well today, so she asked me to step in, and she sends her sincerest regards and thanks you all so much for coming to this panel. Um, I'm excited to be here despite the circumstances. I'm so excited to talk to all of you, these amazing climate justice leaders on the stage with me today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how critical it is to have an intersectional approach to combating the biggest issue of our time. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce everyone to you and then we'll get started. Uh, first, we have Hafsat Abiola. She is the co-founder of Connected Women Leaders, the co-lead of Project Dandelion, and the president of Women in Africa. Next, we have Fabiana Rodriguez, co-founder and president of the Center for Cultural Power. Next, we have Peggy Shepard, co-founder and executive director of, of Executive Director of We Act for Climate Justice, for Environmental Justice, excuse yes. me. They're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> and Shaila Raghav, the, uh, with a new title today, Chief Climate Officer at Time CO2. So I would like to start just by going down the line, I guess, and can you each give us, give us all, give me a brief introduction on your background and what brought you to climate work? Mm. So thank you so much, Anais. Can you all hear me? Okay, so um, I came into climate by way of um, democracy activism, development activism. Um, in my late teen years, um, my family became involved in my country's democratic movement. And at the time, I was a, I was a second year university student. My father came to see me. Um, and he had just won the presidential election in my country, but the military didn't want to have a democratic system. So there was a one year period of negotiations. And in that period, he came to visit me at my university. And when he was leaving, he said, um, Hafsat, you know, African countries are struggling with poverty. While you're at this university, try to come to understand what we can do. So he went back home and ended up in jail the military put him in jail, and then the, my mom started organizing to demand his release and organizing to demand a democratic system in my country. And um, about a few days to my graduation from university, she was gone down in the streets of my, in the um, commercial capital of my country. And so I became an activist at that point, trying to promote the work that they were fighting for. And when we finally got a democratic system, and by the time we got that, my dad also had died in jail. So I always remember the promise I made to him that I would try to think about how African countries can develop as a way, for me, it became a way to keep him close and keep both of them close. And if anyone paying attention to climate would see that um, Africa has contributed the least to the climate crisis, having contributed about 3% of the carbon emissions, but we already suffer the most from the climate um, crisis. And it's impacting our ability to develop at all. So now there's a big question of if, um, about whether we can develop in a green way that doesn't um, undermine the planet. And even if we could, how we would finance it because we're the poorest continent in the world. So all of those questions has me focusing on climate. But in a way, the truth was, um, there's something about women oftentimes that we need to be invited often to take on something. And I was very fortunate that all the work I've been doing on um, activism over decades now, because I'm 49 now, and I started when I was 19. Um, I've met Mary Robinson in that, in that journey. And one day, Mama Mary, um, said to me and a lot, a lot of other women, she said, you're working on all these important issues, but climate trumps all of them, mm. and you all have to work on climate. And that was the invitation I needed to refocus. Mm. Yes, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am from Oakland, California, um, and I grew up during the era of the war on drugs. 
in Oakland in a community impacted by violence, um, mass incarceration, and pollution. I grew up next to a freeway um, that a few years before I was born, there are two freeways where I live, and the freeway that went through the white neighborhood, um, the white neighbors organized so that trucks wouldn't go through their freeway. And so as a result, the freeway that goes through my neighborhood has double the emissions. And so I grew up um, always seeing people with asthma, understanding also that um, my community was neglected. You know, we had food injustice issues. There was issues around how we were racially, pro racially profiled, education. Um, and, you know, this was the 80s. At the same time, there was something that was being born called hip hop. And I remember that as a kid, I would always realize, and, you know, seeing the, the remnants of the Black Panther Party, that stories and narratives and art could offer us a light at the end of the tunnel and that despite everything that was happening, the hardship that art and culture could offer us um, something to imagine our future. And so I became a young activist and uh, I am an artist. And the organization that I run today is about activating the power of cultural workers um, so that we can leverage the power of the emotion and the imagination to bring about justice. And I became involved in climate justice because in reality, I, I, I believe that we are in a planetary crisis because of a core dominant narrative that has been with us for over 500 years. And that narrative is that there are certain bodies that can be exploited for the benefit of the concentration of wealth and power. And that was what happened on this hemisphere. You had the theft of land, you had the stealing of bodies and the stealing of culture, which our systems are based on today. And there are certain bodies um, throughout the world, human bodies, animal bodies, ocean bodies, forest bodies, that get exploited. And that the, the toxicity is in our communities. The poison is in our communities. You can't have oil without exploiting people. And so for me, the question of how we build an economic system is all related to climate, because it's actually how we are in relation to everything that is alive, right? Humans, oceans, natural resources, and we can't solve the climate crisis without addressing racial justice, without addressing gender justice. Um, and I believe that the biggest tool that we are missing is the stories, the art, the culture. We have the data, we have the science, we don't have the art, the culture on Hollywood, less than 3% of all scripted TV and film even talks about climate. And so um, I've come to this work as an artist and as someone that is committed to um, organizing other creatives, bringing them to the table so that we can move towards climate solutions. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peggy Shepard. Uh, I'm co-founder and executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice. We're based right here in New York, up in Harlem, uh, with the DC office. And you know, when climate change is in films, it's about science fiction. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I've yeah. seen a couple lately, and it, it's very scary, but they combine it with aliens and science fiction. Um, but we're, we understand that we are experiencing, starting to experience a lot of those impacts right now all over this world. But you know, um, we all talk about a theory of change for organizations. And so when I was growing up, my personal theory of change was to make an impact on the world around me and to be an integral part of the dynamics of, of our world. And so when I first you know, got out of school, came to New York, um, it was as a newspaper reporter, uh, from the Midwest, working in magazines, where I thought that I could talk about issues and write about issues that impacted women. But back in that day, uh, magazines were very concerned about their advertisers. So they weren't really interested in talking about the issues I thought were important. Uh, domestic violence, reproductive rights, um, you know, all of those kinds of issues that really impact women and our families. And so, uh, once the magazine that I was working for um, at Black Enterprise uh, decided not to, to move ahead and publish, 
I left and became a speechwriter uh, at a state agency and got involved more in politics. And so I became the pub public relations director for the Manhattan campaign for Jesse Jackson, which was a very, very exciting time. Everybody under 30 in New York City was part of the Rainbow Coalition. It was so exciting. And my job was to promote uh, all of these young people who were running to be delegates at the convention. And so it really gave me an opportunity to go around the city and see the differences in neighborhood, neighborhood conditions, neighborhood advocacy, uh, neighborhood benefits. And so after uh, he did not uh, win the primary, um, the campaign manager, Bill Lynch, asked me, do you want to be uh, producing other people behind the scenes, or do you want to be out front with your own ideas? And being you know, the person who sat in the back of the room and never raised their hand, <laughs> unless I was positive of the answer, I thought, well, this might be a little self-improvement as well as you know, pushing forward on uh, really progressive political issues in Harlem. And so I did run as a Democratic district leader. Uh, I was elected. And the first issue that community residents came to me about was a sewage treatment plant mm -hmm. in the Hudson River, spewing emissions that, were, emissions that were making everybody sick. And so we launched a six-year organizing campaign, ended up suing New York City, getting the plant, um, getting what was a brand new plant, uh, another 55 million to fix it. Mm -hmm. But you know what this campaign really did um, sure, there was a $1.1 million environmental benefits um, fund for the community, but it also really institutionalized environmental education inquiry into a, a very uh, large cohort of several hundred people in the West Harlem community, which meant that we were ready to look at all of those conditions in our community, because once you realize once you realize the impacts, the negative impacts of certain environmental exposures, then you really begin to look around at your community and the things that you just once walked by without any thought that you thought were just normal, you realize are not normal. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to talk to and you know, do outreach to, to regular folks who say, you know, I just thought it was part of my life that I had to live in bad conditions in my home with holes in the ceiling, with, with mold. And you know, this was a young high school kid. You know, we were doing some training in a local high school. And she said, I just thought that was the way it had to be. And she understood that that was not the way it was supposed to be or had to be and that she could make that change. Mm. So that's what's really propelled me. Um, over the last 35 years of doing this work. Okay. Uh, I'm Shaila Raghav. My career has gone through a windy path, but I think the unifying theme that kind of stitches everything together is, I think, fundamentally a love for nature. Um, when I was a kid, I remember watching images of the um, Amazon rainforest being de deforested and just crying and not being able to fathom how we could destroy something that is a part of us. And so I started my career, I think there were probably two formative experiences when I started my career working on climate change. The first one was actually moving and spending a few years in the Latin America and Caribbean region and experiencing firsthand how climate change is affecting local fishermen and women, but then working with them on designing solutions. And for many of them, they had been in their career, in their line of trade for generations. And we're now confronting for the first time having to reskill or, or um, shift their entire um, uh, form of livelihood, um, which for them was, was really something that, that takes a lot of time and a lot of empathy to, to work through that process. Um, and then after, after I spent a few years actually on the ground working on climate change, I had the opportunity to design systems at the international level at the World Bank. And the problem with international finance is that oftentimes it gets directed through governments in a way that a lot of those resources are then 
um, used by international consultants and take a really long time to hit the ground. And so we were really tasked with finding mechanisms that could enable direct access to financing so that the funding can be more locally directed and that more of those resources could be retained by local communities. So I would say those were those really shaped my career and then I spent a long time working at Conservation International on um, natural climate solutions and a big part of what we did was recognizing the important role of indigenous people and local communities in stewarding land um, and really uplifting and raising nature as a climate solution which for the fa past few years has really been marginalized. A lot of the discussions on climate focus on energy, on private sector, um, and we see nature as an externality, not as part of fundamentally addressing climate change. And so I've really spent my career advocating for, for a voice for nature, for uh, the uh, investment case for nature. Um, and now I focus predominantly on communications because so much of this boils down to not just hitting people in the head with facts, but in the heart. That's right. Yes. Such valuable work being done by these four people across this stage. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get started with Hafsat. So my first question is, much of your work sits at the intersection of feminism and climate solutions. So you, can you tell us all why it's so important to address these together? You know, so a lot of people are talking about climate change now. I was earlier this month on behalf of um, the project that we're working on, Project Dandelion, um, I was this month in Kenya, where the government of Kenya convened the leadership of Africa. It's unprecedented in our history as a continent. Convened all the leaders of Africa to look at a common position on climate. So 20 heads of state from across Africa came. Africa has 54 countries and 40 ministers responsible for the environment portfolio came. So essentially 40 countries, but all the countries, because even African Union was represented in, at that event. It's essentially an Africa event to have a common position on climate. And when they did the declaration, it said we, the leaders of African, the countries of Africa, and you know those things that they say, the African Union, international multilateral agencies, you know, they have a certain formula that they list all the key stakeholders. Then they said um, children, youth, women, and academia hereby declare. And then they went through the whole thing. And nowhere in that document did they talk about women being partners in um, providing solutions, in leading the just transition for the continent. Women in Africa um, are 50% easily, or 51% of the continent. Mm -hmm. We're the primary food producers on the continent. Um, you know, we're the ones that are going to teach, because of the gendered roles of the society, we're the ones responsible for teaching children how to prepare for the changes. You know, in terms of now, because of the climate impacts, women and girls are the ones working farther to get firewood f to cook for their children, for their families. They're the ones walking farther to fetch water because the water, the rivers are drying up. There are so many impacts that the climate crisis is already having on women and girls. And the women and girls are already providing solutions. For example, among in our community of women, um, in our Project Dandelion um, community, there is um, Indu Umar, um, Umaru Ibrahim, who is responsible for the indigenous people of um, African countries. If you look at the indigenous communities of Africa and all over the world, the communities that they protect have 80% of the remaining biodiversity mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. These people know how to protect the planet. They've already done, they've already proven that. So, and many of the people that are in the forefront of these indigenous communities are the wise women elders. But here we have all the leaders of Africa gathering and not understanding that they have to put women in the center as partners with them. Yeah. The truth is that there is not going to be any 
rescuing of the planet without women. Mm -hmm. When you have men, and I saw this when we were fighting for democracy, my father had won that election. He was one of the most powerful men in my country. He was one of the wealthiest, was a businessman. So when the military annulled the election, he now sat with the leaders of the military. They started negotiating. Then they put him in jail when the negotiations failed. When my mom became involved in the democratic struggle, she didn't sit down with men to negotiate anything. She went to the streets, she organized the students, she organized the market women, she shut down the economy of Nigeria. Mm. She organized the oil workers union, she organized market unions, all the people of the country. We women, when we are engaged, we don't talk to the people that are in positions of power, we talk to the people that have power, which is the people, and we organize the people. <laughs> When the, when the African leaders are there saying, we want to do, this are what we want to do, and they're not engaging the women, you already have the information you need about why they're not going to do much. And, and uh, which was the reason we said to the women at the event, um, at that climate crisis um, summit, that so they've come out with this declaration. We will now take ownership of that declaration and we will execute it. Because if we say we want to wait for them, it's just to say that we want the planet to burn. Mm -hmm. Which is not to right. say that men do not do, we've seen what they do. But sisters, do you really pay attention to what they're doing? Yeah. Because if we really pay attention, there should be cause for alarm. And we should know that we should join them. Because when you see somebody running towards a cliff and you are there saying he's doing, who is the joker? You are the person running towards the cliff. We should quickly go and grab the person before he <laughs> falls over with all our destiny in his hands and pull him back and say, okay, Oga, what are we going to do? How are we going to work together? So really, we are asking women not to wait to be invited to the table because these men, somehow they think they can do this on their own. You know, I think there's something about the testosterone that creates you know, just in, an illusion of strength. We, so we don't have to wait for an invitation. It's not going to come. We should consider ourselves invited and start looking for what the things to do, how to do it, when to do it. I brought this bag. It's not an accident. You will be thinking, why did she bring such a bright bag? Look at the message on the bag. Well-behaved women seldom make history. You guys, I'm not talking to women about making history. I'm talking to us about saving the future. Mm -hmm. And for that, we, are not going to, we cannot be well-behaved. Enough about being well-behaved, enough about conforming. The code, to decode the meaning of well-behaved, just be brave. Mm -hmm. I'm inviting the women in this room and the women in our world now to just be brave. These men are not going to invite us. We will enter every space. We will enter every space. Thank you so much for that. That was, you know, we can all, I think we can all take the lesson. We need to mobilize, forget the traditional sources of power. We need to mobilize everyone. We need to mobilize yeah. women and they are the ones leading. Mm -hmm. Um, Fabiana, I want to talk about your work at the Center for Cultural Power, a woman-led organization, a woman of color-led organization. Um, so it focuses on cultural change that builds public will for climate solutions. So what role can art and culture play in furthering the movement for gender, racial, and climate justice? Yes. Um, well, you know, first I want to add that the exploitation of the earth is directly related to the exploitation of women. It's a, ide it's, a, it's a set of ideas and a culture that um, has allowed for this exploitation. And, you know, as a reproductive justice uh, uh, organizer, I feel that sometimes this concept of protecting life has been taken away from us, when in reality what we are doing is we are protecting life. We are protecting the ability to live on a planet, all life. Right, because that's, that's actually what we need to do. We need to deprogram 
ourselves because dominant culture has actually severed our relationship to nature. We feel like we are above nature and actually uh, a, a man, a, a patriarchal culture um, has, has facilitated for us to abuse and, and extract from nature. And so we have to shift in how we do that through art and culture. I mean, this is where the art and culture sectors are dominated by men, right? When you think about what happened, the Me Too movement, right? Women in Hollywood, if you wonder why you turn on the TV and you, a lot of the narratives that you're seeing normalize sexual harassment, sexual abuse, um, the images that you see portrayed of women, you hardly see any women of color, we hardly see any Muslim women, Native American women, Asian women, right, on television. Um, men ha have their hands on every single cultural lever, music, Hollywood, theater, publishing, gaming. So we're experiencing the world through the lens of a white, cisgender, able-bodied man. And that is preventing us from having political wins because culture change precedes political change. And a policy is actually the manifestation of an idea whose time has come, but we need to create those ideas. We need to put them out into culture. And so cultural power is directly related to policy power. And if you think about even you know, whether we're looking at Me Too, Black Lives Matter, right? Even our climate justice movement, we need to um, make sure our values become normalized and culture is the fastest avenue for us to do that. Because I can give you all the data, I can give you all the science, I'm not gonna move your rational mind as fast as I can move your emotional, your heart. And once you move your heart, the ability for you to mobilize is gonna happen like that. And so imagine if, you know, we were listening to songs by our favorite artists that talked about the fossil fuel industry or that talked about, hey, let's move towards clean energy. Right? Imagine if you're watching TV and you see solar panels on your favorite TV shows. Right? You see people actually, you actually see that, oh hey, there's another day, there's another wildfire. Right? That's not happening. Um, in our pop culture, we're not seeing things presented back to us and when we do see it, as you said, it's doom and gloom and it's not about solutions. And so we have to leverage the tools of culture and often I think that we've been taught to think, oh it's just about policy wins or legislative wins but we're not bringing artists to the table, filmmakers, musicians, right? And to help train them and make space for them to also have an impact. And so that's the work that we do because we know that, you know, we can't advance on policy solutions fast enough until we begin to create a culture um, that is rejecting the old paradigm, the extractive economy, and that embraces a new way of thinking because again, we can't solve climate change without solving racial justice. And so it's about intersectionality, right? It's about saying, hey, you know, um, uh, black families who are living in the South in highly polluted regions deserve for their children to have clean water. Children in Flint, Michigan deserve clean water. Puerto Ricans deserve uh, support and aid after Hurricane Maria. So how do we create narratives that humanize and help empathize and bring us together as opposed to the highly polarized culture that we have now, which is by design because our, the climate deniers are the same people funding the, uh, the elimination of critical race theory. They're the same funders who are going after trans kids, same funders who want fossil fuel industry and who are taking away our bodily autonomy, right? And they have a massive cultural infrastructure that they activate, you just, you, and we see, we see it over and over. Our side does not have that. And so the work that we do is around building that and making sure that we are putting resources into the field so that we can build uh, cultural infrastructure. So speaking of using storytelling as a tool, using culture as a tool to spread these ideas and spread more effective narratives. Peggy, I wanna to turn to you to ask you, how does your interest in storytelling and human connection propel your work in environmental and climate justice? Well, my original career in journalism and as a magazine editor was to tell stories, stories that impact the lives of everyday families. And when I realized that um, it was hard to do that, 
um, I began to look at, at, at other means. Um, certainly in my organizing, we organize people, we do videos, we let them tell their story about living next to uh, buses that are idling outside their homes, exacerbating the asthma in their children. And we do those two minute videos. We take them to the city council and we hold briefings with our elected officials so that they can see these stories. We also make sure that we can help support people to tell their stories in the most effective way. Um, and so we are ensured uh, we ensure that they can go to the city council and testify or to Albany to lobby around energy issues, climate issues. Um, we really have to create the kind of structure for the solutions that we need, but we have to have the most effective people by these policies um, actually engaged in developing policies and developing the solutions because community folks have the experience they have an expertise that is so needed by government and policymakers and is rarely, rarely employed. So we really understand that you've got to use media. Um, you've got to use community organizing in a way that, that really engages people to tell their own story mm -hmm. and to, um, to really speak truth to power. And when you support people to speak for themselves, that is the most powerful. And now, Shyla, speaking of media, your work with Time CO2 focuses on guiding businesses to transform their practices in alignment with global climate goals. So can you tell us what you have found to be the most effective when communicating the urgency and decisive climate action that businesses need to take? Yeah, sure. When it comes to corporate climate action, I think we are in the midst of a trust crisis. There is a prevailing fear of greenwashing. A lot of companies are now in the practice of green hushing, meaning mm. they're, they'd rather do nothing and say nothing and, wow. and hope to get away with it. Um, and so, you know, we're really, we exist to kind of counteract that and to actually create a, a safe space for companies to talk about their journey, talk about their challenges, but also to, to heighten the degree of accountability when it comes to corporate climate action. Now, when it comes to media and storytelling, unfortunately, a big part of the, the content that we consume on climate is negative. It's leading to a prevailing sense of paralysis, of inaction, of doom, despair. And the reason is because you read content or information on climate, but it doesn't give you a pathway to act. It doesn't actually engage you in a way that enables you to um, convert that awareness or translate that awareness into a specific action that you can take. And so that's exactly what we're doing at Time CO2. It's, it's about creating a new type of content that not only educates, but also activates. Mm. And so that means that, that we really need to be telling inspiring stories, repeatable, copyable examples. Again, not dismissing all of the suffering, not dismissing the reality of climate change, but at the same time making it apparent and real that this is an opportunity for us to to build a better world. It's an opportunity for us to choose the future that we will have, for us to reshape industries. And so a big part of it comes also back to emotion, right? Evoking this sense of fear of missing out, for climate change to be positioned not as something happening to you, but something that we can actually seize our power to respond to. Yes. No, this, this is a, a good foreshadowing of one of our final questions because the, the Climate Museum, we, we, we have the same exact mission. Everything that we do is focused on, you know, people come to our programs every time they ask, what can I do, what can I do? And that's what we have to answer. With the asterisk, I like to add the asterisk of what can we do together when we work together. Um, so we're running out of time, so I won't get to all of the questions that we had planned, but I do want to turn back to Hafsat. Uh, your work with Project Dandelion, Women in Africa, and Connected Women Leaders is rooted in coalition building with activists and world leaders across geographies and across industries. So what has been the most potent lesson when engaging on climate justice with such broad swaths of people? Mm, I think the most potent lesson is um, the importance of keeping the eye on the goal. Mm. I think the Americans, you guys had a documentary keeping um, the eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. yes. That's yeah, of course. So I still remember, I think I was 10 years old when I saw that. I didn't know the experience of African Americans until I saw that, um, that film in Lagos in my family house. I cried. And this um, bag, I got it when I went to get the, um, the mu an award from the National Museum, the um, National Civil Rights Museum, which has their, the venue is where Martin Luther King was killed. And I knelt there and I prayed. You know, movements has so many different components. If we look at the civil rights movement of MLK, so many people came together, so many, um, so, such diverse publics came together. They didn't have the same point of view. They didn't have the same, um, some of their values were not perfectly aligned, but they kept their eyes on the price that African Americans deserve civil rights they deserve to have their rights recognized in the United States. And they work towards that. And that's what we're doing at, um, with Project Dandelion. My partners are here, Rhonda Carnegie. Rhonda, could you stand? And Rhonda, could you get the badges? And just please stand with the badges because we have badges here for everyone. This is the badge. It's the dandelion. Mm. And you already have your dandelion. If you see this symbol, and you also have it, if you see this symbol, let it tell you that the people that have this badge are going to put everything in for climate. That's what it means. It's the dandelion. I don't know if you know this. It's a flower or a weed, depending on your point of view. <laughs> but it's in all seven continents of the world. And um, no matter what you try to do to kill it, you rarely succeed because of its deep root system. It's so resilient. And when you want to spread it, children just take it in their hand and they blow on it and it spreads. And it spreads its own community, sprouting again and spreading itself. So for gardeners that don't want it, it's a nightmare. But <laughs> it's, a le it's a message for all of us who are now being invited to enter these power centers. Your name is Shamila? Shaila. Shaila. Shaila was saying that, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing there is. A lot of companies are lying. Yeah. They're lying. We have to be in there. We have people already in there. They can give us information. We're not enemies. We're in a common fight for the planet. And once we know that we have dandelions everywhere, we connect. And then in this way, we can fight to save the planet. We need information. And we need to know where the lies are. We need to expose them. Mm -hmm. Then we need to also go where we're needed. And the good thing about the dandelion reminds us that, you know, whether we're invited or not, the, we just need to be blown into the room. <laughs> However way we find ourselves in that room, we now make ourselves hard to eject. You know, <laughs> this, is the, this is where we want to go. And, and, you know, there's a lot of fighting. Oh, the one group, like yesterday we met with the group, the disruptors. They're the ones that go into museums in the Netherlands and oh. pour soup on oh. Van Gogh paintings. You, uh, some people are like, oh my God, yeah. Some people don't like them at all. And then, but they're, they're trying to disrupt for climate. Yes. And we, we, we were sitting down, my partners and I were sitting down listening to them because our own thing is, are you working for climate? Then you are an ally. We can discuss your strategies later, but we just want to have, we're, we're creating a very big umbrella. Everybody yeah. should just work for climate. I met with a woman, she has a $100 million fund, all in for climate. There's a guy with a $3 billion fund. If you sit with him, you wouldn't know he has $3 billion. He's all in for climate. And the thing is, we have to make sure that his $3 billion goes to people like this goes to people like this, goes to people on the front lines because the money isn't getting to those people. That's right. And so right. in the end, what I'm saying is we have an opportunity, my brothers and sisters. You know when they came, when the Americans said, um, we believe that all men are created equal, and we saw that they didn't really believe that. <laughs> but you know, but, but now we, but, but we, have, um, we have the opportunity to dream again together mm -hmm. 
and work on it together and create that new world. And climate makes, gives us a global problem. It's everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. And we can all solve it together. Imagine if we all came together and solved it. Yeah. Then at that point, nobody will tell us I'm an ex-supremacist because there's no supremacy. We're all supremacy together. We're all supreme together with all life forms, with water, with fish, with birds. It just changes the whole world. Yes. And we, all of us, if we work together with Project Dandelion, we get the chance to make this world come about. That's what this symbol is. It's a women-led campaign, but not women only. And for men, you've been leading so many world breakthroughs. Isn't it time to give women a, an opportunity? But even if you don't give us the opportunity, we're taking it. So <laughs> now, so everybody, please take a, a, a thing, this thing so that you have your, your badge. And so whenever we see each other, if the baddies don't know what it's about, even better for us. And then we, it's a silent signal to each other that we can work together. Let's work together. The Africans have a saying that I love. It says, when we want to go fast, we go alone. But when we want to go far, we go together. Mm. The climate crisis is such a crisis that requires us to go fast and far. And if we want to go fast and far, then we have to trust each other when we go individually, but we have to create the language and the muscles that allows us to also work collectively. Please let's join together in this movement and work together mm -hmm. and bring about the new world that the world is desperately waiting for. Thank you. So I, that was beautiful, first of all, and I love this image of the dandelion spreading and being resilient and being everywhere. Um, before I get to the next question, I do want to acknowledge that we're unfortunately running out of time and we won't you know, get to cover everything that we wanted to. And I do want to include some time for audience Q&A, so I want to remind people if they do have questions. We might be only able to get to a couple, but to scan the QR code and send your questions in. Um, but going back to, I guess, what might have to be our last question, and I want to hear from all of you. Um, let's imagine for a moment that we are living in a future where climate justice has been achieved. In the present day, where do you see the seeds of this being planted? And going back to you know, having things be actionable, what can people in this room right now do to ensure that we cultivate them? So I want to start from that direction. Right, I'll be super quick. Educating women and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And restoring our connection with the planet, yeah. broken right now. Mm -hmm. well, I believe that here in this country, we have to um, really collaborate with folks in the global south, mm. because we already understand how the companies here and the organizations here are, uh, are in negatively impacting our communities. So we can imagine what's going to happen in um, other countries that don't have strict environmental regulation that we do. So beginning to talk about uh, carbon markets and how that's going to Im in impact indigenous folks, their land use, mm -hmm. their sovereignty. Um, we really have to begin to collaborate and really exchange information in a very intentional and direct way. Mm. Um, I would say is moving uh, big resources to impacted communities. Um, a lot of us come from communities that have been polluted. Um, our ancestors have been exploited. Our wealth has been extracted for the consolidation of power. And we need those resources back. That is what repair is. Uh, and so repair happens through the moving back of resources so that we can accelerate on solutions, it means investing in women, especially women of color. It also means uplifting indigenous solutions. What you said is right on. Indigenous people make up 5% of the world and they are protecting 80% of our world's biodiversity. Why? Because of their worldview. Because our colonial domination worldview is what has gotten us into this mess. This idea that you can abuse nature and indigenous worldview is about the stewardship of nature for the next seven generations. And so when we are uplifting indigenous solutions, whether it's throughout in, in Brazil or throughout the African continent, we are actually focusing on solutions. Supporting indigenous leaders is a climate solution. Supporting impacted communities is a climate solution. I 
I think the last point I wanted to make is that um, I think it's likely that the powerful people in the, on, the, on our planet don't really want change. They may want us to get to a climate safe world, but they want to make the least possible change possible yeah. for us to get there. And they may have calculated that if they, that if they t um, make the least change possible, the planet may lose one, maybe two billion people. And they probably figure that they won't be part of that one or two billion people. You know, because they have so much wealth and it yeah. gives them a lot of protection. And they also have power. Yeah. That is why we have to come together. If the people of the world come together, we're more powerful than the powerful, the so-called powerful. In fact, the so-called powerful depend on us being fragmented, That's separated. Right. And, and what, why we must come together is that we can fight for a climate safe world that then gives dignity to workers. I don't understand why um, coal miners in West Virginia sh who have earned so little should now be without jobs for decades, or in the Midwest of America should be without jobs for decades, why there's so little dignity accorded to workers. Mm. I don't understand why from the 80s, when America was making a significant amount of money from, um, to, from all its productivity, all the profit went to capital, mm. nothing went to, um, to workers, and wages laid flat from the 80s till today. This to me is a great evil. And to me, we have the opportunity to work on these things today. Mm -hmm. We can, by working on climate safe world, we take power from these concentrated so centers and spread it, spread prosperity to, to people in Europe, to America, to Asia, to Africa. Let, let people blossom. It is possible, but only if we unite. And that's why I really think that there's so much that must unite, that, that unites us. We must come together, and then we must begin to challenge the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. They are yes. spending about $4 billion on communications alone That's right. to, to misinform the public about mm -hmm. the crisis yeah. so that you feel like, oh, it's been taken care of, it's not, or it's too late, it's not. And the same thing that the tobacco industry did, and after 20 years, we discovered that what they were doing and we stopped it. But the planet doesn't have 20 years. We actually have seven. That's right. By 2030, if we don't take action, we are finished. Yeah. So I need us, and this is why I keep saying, I keep looking at the women in the room. Women, you talk to children, you talk to your friends, you talk to the person on the bus, you talk to the person in the shops when you're doing your groceries, you're always talking. Talk about climate. That's talk right. about yeah. climate. Don't talk about boyfriend problems or girlfriend problems. Don't talk about, talk about climate. Make climate everything you talk about. The ones of us that are th saying it's not real, it's not real, because they know that with the way the power structure is now, if we accept that it's real, they'll make us pay from money we don't have to solve it. Explain to them that climate justice is a thing where the vulnerable are not the ones we're going to pay. We're going to have to tax the fossil fuel industries who are making trillions. Yes. Oh. So, you know, there's so much solutions available. We must be bold. Mm -hmm. And I will close by telling us this. We're being bold, not for ourselves. Because by ourselves, we're not so bold. But we're bold on behalf of the children, the grandchildren and the ones that are still coming that we do not mm -hmm. see. They're actually on their way because my worldview, they're like the stars and they're making their, they're orbiting, they're coming. And they're confident, I, I see them, stars coming to the planet Earth and they're happy. They're just flying in the universe, just coming, they're just coming. And they feel, they see that there's a problem in the planet. They see that it looks like it's burning, but they have no fear because they say, aren't those people there already to solve it? It's a question they're asking. What will we answer? Thank you. All right, so I do want to get to one audience question, and that was actually a fantastic answer to this question, so I would love to hear from everyone else on the panel. But uh, I guess Anonymous asked, what advice would you give to new women 
climate storytellers to get their writing, or I guess I would like to add their artwork, their stories, their, their you know, whatever that, that format is. What, would you, what advice would you give them to get that out into the world, to put that out into the world? Let's start with you, Fabiana. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm an artist who didn't go to art school, and um, it was through the tools of technology that I was able to reach my audiences. And I think that the way that our media landscape is today, a lot of us have tools to amplify and to create our platforms, to distribute our stories, to express ourselves, to share our voices. And I always encourage, I work with a lot of artists, and I encourage artists to really think about how they're getting their message out, right? Whether it's on social media, building a blog, building a presence, uh, a video blog, and having a podcast, right? I think we need all the media tools because also media consumption is changing, right? Folks are not watching in the same way. Younger people are more on TikTok and other platforms than they are even engaging with traditional television. And when they're watching a movie, they're watching it at 1.5 speed, right? And so the way we are absorbing ideas is shifting and we need to also diversify our storytelling strategies. And I would also say like, you know, work with your local newspapers, right? Propose stories, do uh, write letters to, um, uh, letters to the editor. And I would also say like, from an activist perspective, what Greta Thunberg sat outside of her high school. And I always say that real culture changers, it just takes one, it starts with one, right? It started with one story to have a revolution in Hollywood around Me Too. It starts with one story. And so how you get your story out there and, and being creative and creating the space for more stories, I love what you said, is to gather circles to think about how we tell, how we talk about the courage to confront the crisis and how we get our voices out there because stories change people and people will then change systems. I want to give you space to add to that, both of you. Could you just repeat the question? Oh yes, sure. It was basically, um, what would you, what advice would you give to a person who is new to climate storytelling and, and how to best get their message out to share their, their writing or their artwork? To impact, for example, to impact policy, I guess, in your case. Well, the best messages come from experience mm -hmm. and it comes from telling, telling your truth mm -hmm. and how you understand it and how you're experiencing it. Um, but you know, it's gotta be more than this. It's gotta be political action, folks. That's right. It's gotta be registering to vote. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be ensuring that the people you're supporting are supporting your goals and objectives. And you've gotta let them know what those goals and objectives are. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want to be electing people who are not climate deniers. That's right. Yet those people are being elected every day. <sighs> so without real political action, because I'm telling you, none of this happens without the political moment. Mm -hmm. You can be an activist for 10, 15 years, and until that 16th year, when you have the right folks in Congress or your legislature or the president, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And so again, we've really got to, to, to really seize the political moment. We could have regime change in a couple of years here, which would be a disaster for not only of us here, mm -hmm. but of the world. Yep. And so again, it's about political action. Political action is telling those stories, mm -hmm. but it's going further and it's ensuring that we can create the policies we need. Mm -hmm. And we're doing some of that here in New York mm -hmm. and we're doing that in other places around this country. And we've got to continue to do that. And what each one of you can do is go back to your home, your neighborhood, your community, your block, or your school, because something there needs to be changed mm -hmm. if we're going to have a better environment and climate. Mm -hmm. And start there, start with what you know and where you are. Mm. Yes. And we'll wrap it up with the business side, if you have any yeah. final I'll keep words. it super quick, because I know we have to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal level, practice. Like practice telling your personal story and practice it with as many people as you can and that will help you to gain the confidence to be able to deliver it to larger audiences. 
The second I would say is Time is publishing its first ever Climate 100 list. Mm. So Time does Person of the Year, Time also does Time 100, most influential people in the world. We're publishing our first ever Climate 100 list in December this year. So if you have a story that deserves being told, please reach out to me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, to, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to everyone for coming today. This yes. is a little bit of a quick wrap up, but I also wanna thank the Nest Climate Summit, or the, Cli the Nest Climate Campus, Climate Week, and the Javits Center, and of course, all of you. Thank you so yes. much for- Please, everyone, get a dandelion.